math is hard. And SAT math is really hard. But it's much more approachable if you prepare for the math section the right way. And in this video, we're going to show you how to destroy the SAT math section. So the SAT itself is broken into four sections and the last two test your mathematical skills. The first section in the math area is 25 minutes long and you're not allowed to use a calculator as you work through its 20 questions. So that's around a minute and 15 seconds per question on average. And then during the second math section, you can use a calculator and you'll be given 55 minutes to answer its 38 questions. So that's around a minute and a half per question. So you get a lot more time per question in that second half and a calculator also. And as you'd expect, these questions are more computatively intensive and will occasionally reference graphs or data. Additionally, some of the questions at the end of each section will not be multiple choice, but require you to answer numerically with decimals and fractions. I hate those ones. Take extra time on these and always do a sanity to check on your answer. For example, if the question asks you to calculate the weight of an assortment of foods and Apier gets a negative number as his answer, it's worth your time to run your numbers again. You're telling me I can't go to the store and buy negative three apples? Mm, not as of yet, Abe. Let's just take a quick look at the math topics tested here. We have algebra, we'll go over some key topics in all of these, uh, geometry also, pre-calculus, um, and then just a quick word about these questions themselves. Um, we're going to go more into detail on some common ones, but even though these questions can be complex and take a long time to figure out, nothing in these sections is going to be outside of what you've learned. So you should be going into this knowing everything. And well, Frank, that is assuming they've taken pre-calc. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and again, we will get to this like with what class to take. Uh, the one, I guess, big biggest tip I have for you before we get into what we're looking at here is when you take a look at a question, think if you can solve it quickly, go for it. But if it looks hard at all, remember that, you know, this is a time test. Just skip the ones that you really freak you out and move on to the next one. And definitely don't forget that you're not going to get penalized for guessing. So answer every question to maximize your chances of getting a high score. Let's dive into some commonly forgotten concepts. The first one that we're going to look at is vertex form. So, you know, here you can see you know, this ax squared plus bx plus c is just an equation for a quadratic. That's fancy language for a curvy line with one hump. And vertex form is nice and convenient because it allows us to see the location of the vertex immediately just by looking at it. So when you have it in vertex form, um, you can see in the equation here, h and k are going to give you the coordinates of the vertex. All right, Abe, I still don't really understand. Could you show me an example? Of course. So check out this example from one of the college board's practice SAT tests. So it's asking us to find the equation from which we can read off the coordinates of vertex A. They're basically dancing around the idea of put it into vertex form. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the equation given, this y equals x squared minus 2x minus 15, and we're going to complete the square. That's the procedure for putting a quadratic like this into vertex form. Google that, look it up online if you're unfamiliar with it. And then it's super simple from there. Once we've completed the square, as here, we immediately see that the answer is D. All right, arc length is the next concept we're going to look at. And you're going to want to memorize this formula down here. But I actually encourage you to truly understand it, and then memorizing it will be a lot easier. So this first component, this 2 pi r in the formula, is the circumference of a circle. And then we multiply by this theta over 360, keeping in mind that a circle has 360 degrees in total when we go all the way around, but we're only focused on a certain portion of the circumference. So we're going to take this fraction of the circumference. That's why we have this theta over 360 degrees. Let's also look at an example. Perfect. Here's an example of arc length. So here we're asked to find the length of arc A, B, C. But we don't have much information regarding this part of the circle, so we're going to start over here where we do have information. So we know the length of arc ADC is 5 pi, and we know that x is 100 degrees. So we can go ahead and apply our formula from the last slot. Here I plugged in 100 as the theta in the fraction, and then we're going to solve for r right here to get r is equal to 9. Okay, now we have more information. We can once again apply the formula 
from the last slide. We're gonna fill in 260 here for the degree fraction because you know, of course, a circle is 360 degrees in total, and if x is 100, then this other angle right here spanning um, arc ABC must be 260. We can go ahead and solve the formula, plugging in r equals 9 to get 13 pi. The answer is b. All right, so the next concept we're going to look at is slope-intercept form. And honestly, I think slope-intercept form is super useful. Anytime I see a linear equation, I put it into slope-intercept form. When I say linear equation, I just mean an equation with one x. You know, no x squared, no x cubed, nothing fancy like that. And the reason I do that is because slope-intercept form is super useful. It tells you the y-intercept, so it tells you a point on the line, and it tells you where the line is going after that point, before and after that point, because it tells you the slope. So Frank, you can walk us through one example. Yeah, so building on that concept, this practice problem immediately gives us a slope of 1 over 7, and it tells us that this line passes through the origin, aka 0, 0. So we know that the y-intercept of this, aka b, is going to be 0, and the m, or slope, is going to be 1 over 7. So we build our equation, which simplifies down to y equals 1 over 7x, and then we just, for this one at least, we just plug in our answers until we get one that makes sense in this case, 14 over 2 does equal 7, so that's our answer. Here's a more uh, in-depth question from Abe. Yeah, so sometimes you're going to get these more qualitative questions that play on slope-intercept form. So here we're asked, we're given an equation um, for the number of phones left, and we're asked, what's the meaning of the value 108? Well, first thing here, we just see there's a single D. This is a linear equation. Let's put it into slope-intercept form. That's what slope-intercept form is. Here's what the equation looks like when we just switch around the minus 23d term and the 108 term to put it into slope-intercept form. And then, because we know what slope-intercept form is, and we see that b is 108, that's the y-intercept, it's very easy to tell that Kathy starts each week with 108 phones to fix. The answer is b. So the next concept we're going to look at is isosceles triangles. Frank, take it away. Isosceles triangles are pretty straightforward. You got two sides in this triangle that are going to be equal to each other, ED and EF. And you also have two angles that are going to be equal to each other, in this case, EDF and EFD. And we're going to use those concepts to answer a lot of qu uh, questions coming up. Let's take a look at this one. Yeah, so full disclosure, this example gets a little bit intense. Ugh, can't spell isosceles without SOS. Help us out here, Abe. All right, I'll see what I can do. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna start out by doing is writing out this equation. And the reason why we're able to write this out is because we're stealing it from the question. And it tells us 180 minus C equals 2Y and Y is 75. Great, let's solve for Z. Z is 30. And then we can go ahead and write this equation. And you might be wondering, what is A, Abe? Well, A, is these two angles right here that we know are equal because of the properties of isosceles triangles. Where are we getting this equation? Well, all the angles of a triangle need to add up to 180, and we know that z is already 30. So a plus a, or 2a, needs to add up to 180 minus 30. Great, let's solve for a. a is 75. So now that we know that this angle right here is 75, and we know that this straight line must add up to 180 degrees, so a plus x must be 180, we can solve for x. x is 105. Very cool. Oh, what do you know? Another isosceles triangle. This one's extra special because it has that 90 degree angle in there, so we actually know all the angle uh, measurements, 45, 45, and 90. And then we know that these two side lengths are going to be the same because it's an isosceles. And then because it's a right triangle, we know that the hypotenuse is simply the side length multiplied by radical 2, as we can prove with the Pythagorean theorem. This is a really cool triangle because it means that if we know the length of one side, we know the length of all the sides. And that's something we see with the 30, 60, 90 triangle as well. Yeah, so similar concept here. Unfortunately, this triangle is not isosceles, so all three sides are of different lengths. But again, if we know the length of one side, we know the length of all three sides. And the ratio here between the side lengths is basically one to radical three to two. So the 30 degree side, 30 degrees is the smallest angle. That's the shortest side. 
The 60 degree side, that's the next biggest. That's second place. And then of course the 90 degree angle has the two, it's the longest side. Now moving away from triangles, we come to vertical angles. And these are pretty straightforward. It's just like looking in a mirror. If you're angle one, you're gonna be the same measurement as angle three. And if you're angle two, you're gonna be the same as angle four. Basically, as long as those lines are straight, the angle measures are gonna be the same when they look across from each other. But you know what the SAT is really good at? It's taking these super simple basic concepts and still finding a way to ask difficult questions. So here, we're asked, what is the value of y? Well, we know that y plus 4x must equal 180, but we can't solve that equation because there's two unknowns and only one equation. So let's look instead here, because we see that y and 2x are vertical angles. So we can set up an equation like this, 6x equals 180. That's 2x plus 4x, and we know because they're on a straight line, they must add up to 180. We solve for x, x is 30, and we know that y is equal to 2x because they're vertical angles. So y is 60. And then building off that finally, I think a good thing to do would just be to memorize all those formulas that are given to you in regards to the math section. It's gonna save you time. And also if you take the care to look at these formulas ahead of time and really understand what each of them means, it's gonna help you on each of these problems because you're immediately going to know which formula to apply. You won't have to waste time trying to fit which trying to fit the right one to the problem. Now let's segue into some longer term strategies. All right. So in short, if I had to summarize long term preparation, I would say take the hardest math classes in high school. Really try and take algebra two and trigonometry before you take the SAT. That's because the SAT tests on things like complex numbers and systems of equations that are covered in algebra two. And you can see examples of those kinds of questions below here. Now, the reason why I tell you to take the most difficult math classes is because the more time you spend in these difficult math classes, thinking about math and practicing, the better you're going to get at math and the better you'll be at the SAT. You know, we like to make psychology videos and here more than ever, nurture in the nature versus nurture debate really becomes valuable. But to be fair, most of you or many of you might not have several weeks or months to prepare for the SAT math section. You might just have days or even hours. So here's some advice on short-ish term preparation. Yeah, so if you only have a couple days left, we'd suggest going to Cod Academy's practice tab and going through the four quizzes and each of their modules under all math practice. This is just what we did personally, but any of the free resources out there for SAT math are great. Uh, regardless of what you choose, start a Google Doc as a log for all the questions that you're practicing. And any time you answer a question incorrectly, due to a flaw in your understanding, aka not a stupid mistake, write the question down in that log. And then the next time you sit down to study the SAT, try the question again. Um, and don't look at the answer, actually solve the question fully by hand. Much of the time, you'll feel like you understand a question just by reading over the answer, but promise you will improve much more and learn much more if you actually take the time to fully solve the question and make certain that you can answer it. So if you are actually confidently solving the question, you can delete it from your list. If you have solved it with some hesitation, you should probably move it to another practice again section. Um, and if you go through the practice questions for a certain skill and the content seems especially challenging or unfamiliar, so like all geometry questions are kind of tricking you, take time to watch the how-to examples and really look through each of those questions and learn them on a case-by-case -case basis. And finally, the most efficient way to practice for the SAT math section is just by simply doing as many practice problems as you can get your hands on. Frank, that is exactly right. So if we had to summarize how to study for SAT math in one sentence, we would say run through as many practice questions as possible. I know we have short term preparation as the title of this slide, but let me emphasize that practice questions are very useful at any step of your studying process, long term or short term. Now, where do you look for these practice questions? Well, in addition to all the practice modules and videos that we already discussed, the College Board and Khan Academy have published free practice tests, 10 in total. These are great because they were designed by the College Board who also makes the real SAT and there are thorough answers available to each of the questions also for free. 
Now, if you get through all of those questions, we then recommend you use the Princeton Review prep books. I would go with this one. I used an earlier edition of it myself. It's great because it doesn't include all the strategy fluff that isn't very helpful. It just gets straight to the point with practice tests. And make sure to always time yourself on the practice tests you take so you develop a natural feel for how long you can spend on each question and how much time you have left on the section. Use the same strategy that we discussed earlier as you go through these practice tests. If you miss a math question for any reason other than a stupid mistake, write it down, save it in a doc, and practice it again until you can do it right from start to finish on a piece of paper. The math section was always where I did the worst on the SAT. But even if math isn't your thing, it doesn't mean you can't do well on the math section. And use this as motivation. By the time you're done studying for the SAT math section, you will know more math than our first president. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And comment down below if you have any questions. As always, we'll catch you guys next, next time. time.